we welcome you to another edition of Being Well Informed. My name is Claudia Barber, and I am your host, podcast host, and also a YouTube presentation host that uh, on this fine afternoon, our specific topic today is election polls and what happens at election polls. I have fantastic guests. What happens irregular at election polls? I have Amy Cruz from the American Civil Liberties Union here in Maryland. And also, is it Joanne Antoinette? Uh, Antoine, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm messing your name up. Joanne Antoine uh, from Common Cause of Maryland. Th two fabulous guests to help us unpack this whole concept of what happens irregular at election polls? Tell us a little bit about yourself and welcome to Being Well Informed. Amy, we'll start sure. with you. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Um, we are uh, very excited to be able to talk about this topic with you and your listeners. My name is Amy Cruz. I'm the legal program manager at the ACLU of Maryland, um, but I'm also the director of elect the election protection campaign here. Um, and a little bit about uh, the ACLU and about election protection here is that um, the ACLU of Maryland's mission in part is to dismantle um, or in all of the work that we do, we are trying to dismantle white supremacy along with the systems that intentionally marginalize the needs of people um, who are most impacted by injustice. And this um, uh, also is part of our election protection work. So to that end, the goal of our election protection campaign um, or our voting rights work in general is to make sure that we have an election infrastructure that guarantees universal suffrage and robust access to the ballot. And that includes everyone who is incarcerated in our state having the right to vote. Um, another well, part of that, go ahead. Well, you know, uh, I just flipped on my, my, my local uh, uh, review of new pre-filed bills in the Maryland legislature for the General Assembly 2023 voter identity bills. Mm. and uh, uh, absentee ballot bills, uh, changing the laws. Where'd that come from? I might punt that over to Joanne. <laughs> um, maybe I will jump in and thank you so much uh, for having me on. You know, me and, closely, uh, me and Amy work really closely, so I'm excited to always be um, in spaces with her. Um, I mean, I, I think when, you're, when we're looking at... Um, voter ID bills, um, some of the mail-in voting bills, I think it's important for viewers to remember that even in a state like ours, where many believe that it's blue, um, we do still have legislators that spend a great deal of time um, working to roll back access to the ballot. So looking for any hurdles that they can place uh, to make it difficult for voters to um, exercise their right to vote at the polls. Um, so the voter ID laws, thankfully, um, I shouldn't say thankfully, hopefully those don't go anywhere. Um, we see them introduced every session. Um, even last year when we saw all of those um, how would I say those Republican, unfortunately, Republican um, led um, bills being introduced all throughout the country, things like the um, Certification Act and so forth. We saw them here in Maryland and uh, the General Assembly kind of kept them in a drawer. So hopefully it's the same thing this session, but um, this is where ACLU Common Cause Maryland and partners are um, paying close attention to make sure that we see no movement um, this session. That's that's important. I think it's such uh, a significant part of uh, keeping the electoral process uh, open and, and with access to all that are eligible to vote. So a lot of times you see in voter identification uh, laws, uh, signature verification. Um, I mean, what's the what's the point in that type of uh, legislation? I mean, I think we all could jump in. I So this is signature verification, I'll be honest, is a really difficult issue um, because it is, as Maryland, especially when we're looking at our state, as more people begin to vote by mail, um, there do need to be more security parameters put in place. But um, we know that 
if Maryland were to explore signature verification, we need to pay really close attention because it could very well disenfranchise voters. You know, I don't know about you, but when I was 18, my signature now looks nothing um, the same. Um, for the person who with disabilities, their signature may never um, look the same and so forth. So, um, you Excellent know, point. it's not something that we want here in the state, but if it is something that we have to explore again as we move towards more people voting by mail, I think this is where all of our organizations will be spending a great deal of time to make sure that it's a process that um, truly um, wouldn't disenfranchise, even unintentionally disenfranchise voters um, from the franchise. Excellent point. Suppose someone is like paralyzed from the neck down. Now, how do, how do they get around the signature verification law yeah. if you're going to put that into into effect yeah or the person who really doesn't know how to read and write i mean i have a, a aunt who is the same she votes um we go in and assist her but because she never went to school right and so forth her signature is just kind of a marking it doesn't even really show her name so again just making sure we have to keep all those things into consideration um if maryland were ever to move into that direction so i will say this uh, our, our general election occurred in November 2022, and the mail-in ballot greatly impacted the outcome. That's the only way I can ex explain it in my particular county, which was Anne Arundel County. Uh, when, we, when all the voting counts were in of, just, of the elected officials that, that were just on that day, the mail-in vote were not counted. And there was this enormous change in the outcome of the county executive race and uh, some other races. So the so this is the what we're seeing here is the impact of mail in, in voting and the, and the fact that there to me it sounds like it's greater access. So how would you assess that situation? So um, this kind of brings us back, I think, mostly to 2020, um, which was when the Everyone Votes Coalition and the Expand the Ballot Coalition were working um, around the clock in order to make sure that we had an election that was safe and secure um, and accessible and equitable during the beginning of the pandemic. So we had, I think we had three or four statewide of elections because we had a special election that year. Um, and that's when we um, were advocating for robust mail and mail-in voting. And that's also when we became, um, Joanne and I became kind of experts at the mail-in voting process because um, we realized that the process of mailing an application and then making people mail an application back in and then getting their ballot and mailing their ballot back in, while to some people that may seem like a simple process, um, as you were mentioning um, before, there, there are people where that number of steps can be gigantic barriers. So we had several stories of people who um, weren't going to be able to fill out those forms on their own. They had to have a neighbor help them. There were issues of um, mailing them back or um, you know, security of their mail where they were living. And so this is where we were advocating for that year, for 2020, for people to just get their, every all registered voters to get their ballot mailed to them. And that opened up the conversation about the importance of mail-in ballot in order to provide equitable um, and accessible elections. And I just want to throw in, because this is kind of coming up already a lot in this conversation is that um, we need to make sure that our elections officials and our policymakers are thinking about um, all, you know, all people when we're talking about voting. So we're thinking about people um, who have disabilities, people who are in confined housing, people who are in jails and prisons, um, people who may live in very rural areas where, um, you know, the closest library or school is quite far from them. So we need to be thinking about all everyone um, and in order to have an equitable and accessible election. Including people without transportation. Exactly. Yeah. You have anything else to add to that, Joanne? I mean, I second everything Amy said, right? I think the pandem pandemic kind of 
moved us uh, towards uh, mail. And I think as voters used it for the first time, because I think it was less than 5% of the electorate that was voting, or less than 10% um, that was voting by mail prior to the pandemic, I think voters liked the experience. And you know, now that the forms have been updated, we've got secure drop boxes out. Um, I think Maryland, we're making, here in Maryland, we're making sure that voters have all options, whether it be you prefer to vote in person, by mail, um, or, well, we don't really have any, or um, on election day, right? So whatever mm -hmm. is more sensitive mm -hmm. to you, um, being able to engage at whatever um, point in the process um, in, a, in a manner that's um, the best for you. Well, I just will go on the record and say, I applaud uh, the Maryland uh, election process to the extent that we have early voting. We actually had seven days of early voting. Then you have the actual primary day or general election day to vote. Then we also had as a third option, mail-in ballots. You know, then you also had a fourth option of drop off the ballots uh, in a drop box. Then you also had this situation where if he requested a mail, and actually I fell in the situation for the general election, I requested a mail-in ballot and I never got it. So I had to cast a provisional ballot and that provisional ba ballot option was still available. So we have option, 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 applause, applause, applause for the legislature in creating such a system that is that uh, robust. But, you know, I guess it wasn't always that way from, from historically. Uh, but Maryland is one of those states in which we have uh, uh, an entire week of early voting. And, you know, polls are, are open from sunup to sundown, um, uh, pretty much, uh, which gives us the opportunity, again, to choose one of those days. Even if you can't do it on a weekday, you can do it on a Saturday or a Sunday which is to me uh, extremely important. But when you brought up the issue of secure drop boxes, what happens irregular at election polls? So I should start off by saying, you know, we say secure drop boxes because as of right now, um, in Maryland, there's been no evidence that um, there's been tampering with our boxes, right? Um, the boxes are monitored 24 seven, either by an actual in-person security guard um, or by camera. Uh, there's regular pickups at least two to three times a day from election um, officials with a secure chain of custody um, around the materials and how they're making it to their facility. Um, so I, I think in terms of like the drop boxes themselves, we haven't seen any issues so far um, outside of making sure that the placement of the boxes that everyone, you know, regardless of circumstances, if the person has a disability, that they can actually access it and put their materials inside. Where we are seeing issues, unfortunately, is at polling locations, um, specifically outside of them. And I'm sure Amy could give some examples too, but in this climate that we're in, I keep telling everyone again, Maryland, you know, we we're good on voting rights, even though it takes a lot of advocacy to get uh, our legislators to do the right thing. Um, but even when we're moving forward with these reforms, there are bad actors that are going to great lengths to intimidate voters, to confuse voters, especially young people, um, black and brown folks and so forth. And I, I think that is where we're seeing the ir irregularities um, um, if we want to call them that, right? Like people that are going out of their way um, to find any way possible to, um, you know, turn a voter away from the polls. Well, you know, you raised that point of turning voters away from polls. Uh, also there, the, now again, uh, how does, in this whole concept of election protection, there is always this big elephant in the room of misinformation in campaign literature too. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think the misinformation and um, uh, myths about voting are uh, a huge part of what I would call the irregularities that we are faced with. And so part of it is on the myth side, it's that 
there's a lot of fear and a lot of worry about things that actually have not happened that do not threaten our elections. Um, and so in a lot of these conversations, whereas Joanne brings a lot of technical knowledge about um, you know, security and privacy and um, some of the technical aspects. Uh, and I'm not saying that's all. Um, she also has the advocacy side that I'm about to say, which is I'm in favor of a true democracy where everyone has the right to vote and everyone has equal and accessible um, access to being able to vote. And so to me, if you're going to take that away, make that harder, build up a barrier, I need to have actual evidence or facts to show that that's a problem. And so a lot of things, even with security of um, security issues, I'm, um, I want to make sure that we have privacy rights, um, you know, protected and make sure that everything is safe and secure. But if there isn't proof that there has been a problem, then I don't want to set up a new a barrier. But the misinformation, whether it is put out by campaigns, so somebody running or a political party, um, or if it's a mistake, and that happens a lot, even from our boards of elections, where they send out information that um, has an error in it, that can cause real problems, that can cause real confusion. And so um, I think that one thing we're seeing is that we do have all those structural things in place to have a robust um, voting system, all of the things that you mentioned, Judge Barber, of all of the options. Uh, however, if people are confused, if people don't trust the system, if people believe that they don't have the right to vote or they're supposed to go through some hoops to vote, even if even if the law is that they can vote, but they believe they can't, that's where we have a situation where such a low percentage of people are voting. We have mm. all of these options, but it's the misinformation, um, the confusion, and then this the myths um, or misinformation. Some of which I just want to kind of end with is a legacy um, and intentional. Um, that people believe that they cannot vote if they have had a history with the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. so that is something that we are making a choice not to do more to educate and clarify that if you are not currently incarcerated for a felony conviction, so that's everyone who's home, everybody who is um, on probation and parole, everybody who is not currently incarcerated for a felony conviction, um, they have the right to vote. People in jails and prisons serving a misdemeanor sentence also have the right to vote. That information, if you've ever done get out the vote, if you've ever done voter registration, you have met somebody who thought that they can't vote when in fact they absolutely can. That to me is the biggest injustice in what's going on in our state. And again, I'm not pointing fingers at any one person or entity. I think as an advocacy community, led elected officials, um, policymakers, we absolutely need to prioritize um, education and making sure that those that that misinformation, myths, mistakes um, stop. We we're too sophisticated. We have too much money in this state um, to have that many mistakes and that much misinformation happening. You know, I distinctly remember when I ran for judges on the circuit court in Anne Arundel County, uh, there were four spots and there were uh, there was information on the ballot that says you can can vo uh, vote for up to four. But there were people uh, that were telling voters they had to vote for all four which was not accurate. They could vote for one of the four. They could vote for two of the four. They could vote for three of the four. They could vote for all four, but they did not have to vote for all four. So you see that type of information or disinformation spreading. So how do you, uh, you know, correct that if somebody says, well, I want to vote for only one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that is actually a really good example because we hear it all the time, even with central committees. I think that's another yes. one where, you know, there could be a list of like 20 folks running and, um, you know, voters, even the ballot style itself can be confusing. So I do think as a state, hopefully, um, based on some of the confusion this past election, specifically around central committees, my hope is that um, there will be a conversation looking at the layout, making sure the voter understands when we say up to this amount, that you don't actually have to vote for all six or four in your case if you don't want to. You can choose for one. Um, 
But again, I think this is where the public education piece comes in. Unfortunately, like the only way we can debunk the misinformation is if we're aware of it. So I think part of it is making sure that once we hear that messaging being shared, even if it's through someone who is confused, they mean well and they're just communicating it the wrong way. Um, you know, making sure that you want are correcting them if possible, um, flagging it for the state and local boards because they do have a page. I forgot what it's called, but um, it's kind of uh, the rumor control, right? Where they will make sure that there's clarifying information up. And I think sharing it for, with advocacy organizations so that we can kind of counter that message, amplify where we can to make sure that voters know that you don't have to choose four, you choose, you know, um, up to that amount and so forth. So I think a lot of it is investing in public education. And I think to Amy's point, the state has can invest a lot more <laughs> into that. I think when we look at the 2020 election, it was a unique year, the pandemic, right? And more money was invested into the state board to do um, public ed, to, to make sure that they were doing more targeted outreach. They don't usually get that money um, in an election year. 2022 is a great example where there was very little outreach being done online. Um, so I think it takes the state investing in, you know, making sure that voters understand all of the options, all of their rights, and how to go about voting, you know, up until election day. Well, but you know, from the the uh, candidate's perspective, when you have a situation where, uh, let's say, a coalition says single shoot, uh, you know, it's more powerful to vote for one of the four judges as opposed to all four. And so if people are told by, let's say, uh, election judges, you must vote for all four. How do you dispel that myth? Well, it's, I mean, if it's not true, they absolutely should be. I mean, these words are important, right? And so to say must vote for all four is very different than you can vote for up to four. And so um, if a an election official or judge or worker um, is saying that, then that's, um, you know, something that should be uh, corrected as soon as possible. And that's something that... Um, Joanne and I both work on different election protection hotlines, um, but we work closely together and communicate in real time. And this would be an example of something that if you had heard that that happened somewhere, um, especially like during early voting or the middle of the day on election day, if you call one of our hotlines, we have um, pretty good success rate at being able to correct that, change that language, maybe put a, you know, they could put information out to all of their election judges to make sure that they don't say that anymore. <laughs> mm. Okay, so that's that's helpful, uh, especially when you get people, let's say, that are 90 years old and they're trying to fill out the ballot. And, you know, an election judge might be passing that information on to that person, assisting them with the ballot. Uh, that might be uh, impactful in terms of um, uh, voter, voter outcome. Uh, so uh, there are other irregularities, I'm sure. What types of election irregularities have you observed? Well, I, if I can just jump in real quick to, to, to uh, kind of add on to what we were just talking about, because it, I want to acknowledge that we both, we highly res respect and uh, work very closely with our state board of elections um, partners, staff at the state board and the local boards have like, you know, a humongous uh, job to do with all of those types of elections. They're running like three or, you know, three different elections kind of at the same time with early voting and election day and mail-in voting. Um, that being said, they definitely need more resources. They need more funding. We need to fund them better. Um, and they mean, need more staff, which you have to pay people to get more staff. And so what we saw this year was, um, short staffing. And, and what I think probably happened was that they didn't have enough staff and that the staff that they did have, some came in late. Um, these were like staff at the polls. I mean, sorry, I'm talking about um, election, election uh, workers, election judges, that um, they probably didn't have enough time to fully train everyone. Um, I'm sure they're saying everybody got fully trained, but, you know, um, we definitely had a lot of complaints. And this would be an irregularity of people who um, arrived, election judges who arrived at their polling site, and it was the first time they had been there. They didn't know where the bathroom was. They didn't know where to tape the, you know, core, electrical cord. Um, they were 
just getting familiarized with it that day. And so having to deal with those little things, one thing we've heard is having to deal with those little things uh, distracts you from being able to make sure that you're managing um, the people who are working and communicating with um, voters. And so I'll, um, I know your question was about irregularities, but I think what's a really important um, point to make here is that we need to make sure that our elections, our democracy is fully funded and that we have plenty of staff and enough people at polling sites so that we don't have people who are giving out in, inappropriate information so that we don't have really long lines so that we don't have, um, you know, machine outages that could be fixed, that sort of thing. Excellent points. Joanne, you have anything to add to that? I mean, Amy literally stole my <laughs> stole my thought, right? I mean, even as you were giving the example of the judge who maybe is saying you must vote up to four, you know, um, or you must vote for four people. Some of in, in a lot of those situations, it's a person who signed up at the very last minute, you know, to serve as a judge who somehow has found themselves serving as a chief judge now because people aren't showing up. Um, so I, I think as a state, we need to do a better job of recruiting and retaining election judges and, and making sure that they're actually valued and that we're listening to the issues that they're sharing. Um, it's been a problem long before COVID. Um, it continues to be an issue right now. Um, you know, it's election day and we're, we're waking up to polling location consolidations. You know, advocates are running around trying to put up signs, you know, outside of buildings to make sure that people know to go to this location instead and so forth. So I think the staffing probably is the greatest need um, right now, because if we keep moving forward with these reforms, I know one example of a reform, people keep saying they want, um, what is it called, ranked choice voting. We'd love to see that too at some point, but we need to make sure our current system is running well and moving forward with a new reform means that judges need to be able to be in those locations and explain those things correctly. Um, and I don't think right now we're in a position, you know, to, to um, roll out new programs. Um, well, we really not. So we need to move in that direction, it sounds like. So then there's also this question of voter suppression matters. What voter suppression matters has the ACLU or Common Cause of Maryland undertaken? Um, I'll take a first step. Uh, so um, there's voter suppression kind of comes out of two things. It's either intentional and that's um, you know, somebody saying, I want to stop people, certain people from voting or something like that. And then there's structural, which is, um, you know, arguably unintentional, unintentional from the individual working in it that ends up in people not being able to vote. Much of the work that we do is on the structural side. So as we were talking before, just all of these barriers that are unnecessary and could be fixed that keep people from voting. Um, the biggest example there are currently and formerly incarcerated people. Um, again, because of this legacy of us actually um, taking people's rights away permanently in the past. So when I first started at the ACLU um, a long time ago, there the law was that lots of people were permanently for life banned from voting. And so that that legacy has you know, passed on and people now still believe that there's a connection, not everyone, but there is this belief that if you've been arrested, if you've done time, um, that sort of thing, then you can't vote, which is not true. And so that's um, a structural um, voter suppression matter, um, in my opinion. And then there's intentional and intentional can look like um, redistricting uh, or districting plans that intentionally um, are diluting the black vote, which is something that we've um, at the ACLU work on, especially every 10 years after the census and something that we have spent a lot of time over the last year along with Common Cause. And so redistricting, um, possibly some um, ra racially discriminatory redistricting plans are not intentional, but often they are. And then, um, you know, another piece of the structural uh, voter suppression is that confusion we talked about earlier, the long lines, um, you know, lack of uh, proper or clear information, that sort of thing. And then, you know, unique to 2022, that's not true, not unique. Um, but a big thing that we were dealing with in 2022 was um, the emboldened um, white supremacist uh, and other kind of vigilantes who were threatening um, across the country 
to disrupt our elections and which we actually saw during early voting in Maryland, um, including Anne Arundel County, including Pip Moyer um, nearby us, Judge Barber, where um, an individual, rogue individual, uh, you know, decided to take it upon themselves to confront uh, poll workers. Mm. So voter suppression also can be in the form of, um, you know, white supremacy, intimidation, um, voter harassment, or just generally uh, creating an unsafe space around um, the polling sites. So what public awareness tools or resources that are out there for the public to be more informed, better informed, and well-educated about election polling, election irregularities, misinformation, et cetera? I would say <laughs> resources. I mean, outside of our organizations, hopefully, you know, we're doing robust outreach and able to reach the voter. But again, um, I think this is where local boards and state boards of elections um, have to play a role in making sure that voters are receiving accurate information on all their voting options, um, where to report issues. Um, all, both of our organizations work with hotlines. So I think for the voters who, even if you're not sure it's an issue, it doesn't feel right, we say call and report it anyway, and we will go and um, investigate further to see what's happening. I think in that instance with the Pitt Moyer, um, you know, folks might not consider that intimidation, but if our judges are scared of staffing polls, we're running into serious issues. And I think in Anne Arundel, that is the one place where we know for sure that there was doxing that occurred, right? So there are judges in, this, in, in Anne Arundel County where their personal information was released, right? And now they don't want to serve again because they were getting threatening calls and so forth. So I think um, it's going to have to be us taking action as, as voters, making sure that we are calling and reporting issues when we see them, um, making sure that we are also doing our part, taking the resources either from our pages, take the voter guide, whatever it is, and tell people in your community um, help, you know, work with your churches to get out the word and so forth, um, to build on what the local and state board should be doing. Um, hopefully the incoming administration will be investing more, um, to make sure, uh, that people are not only aware of options, but aware of their rights when they go to the poll, knowing that you shouldn't turn away, you can still vote provisionally. Um, uh, I think another demographic where we saw folks were very confused, young people, um, they get very, very confused at the polls. Um, we saw that on election day, I'll use Bowie State as an example, where I think there was some last minute um, turnout, right? Young people are like, let's go vote. They all decided to go to the precinct location where you know, they weren't registered for that precinct. So all of them ended up voting provisional and then oh. they ran out of provisional ballots and so forth. So even thinking about small things like that, how a young person going to vote at the poll, finding out that they're voting provisionally, how, you know, uh, the, the misinformation, right? Thinking that a provisional ballot isn't counted, um, you know, your experience overall going to vote that day and whether or not that that um, leads to you disengaging in the future and so forth. So I think um, we as a state just need to do a better job. We're moving forward with reforms, but not investing enough um, into making sure that people know how to take advantage of them um, and know how to really stand up and advocate for themselves um, if they find themselves in a situation at a poll where their, their um, right to vote is somehow being questioned. We have this uh, tickler crawl, uh, crawling across our screens for the viewers, but for those that are part of the podcast, ACLU, dash md.org aclu dash md.org that's the website for the american civil liberties union here in maryland that's right and common cause what's yours our website would be md.commoncause.org <laughs> well thank you all for your participation of uh, today's uh, being well informed we appreciate your coming here and brightening our day and informing us about election polling irregularities thanks again have a wonderful day thank you for having us
Oh, I think she's gone. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it still says, okay, let me call it. Okay, let's go. 